So today we're going to talk about what would be a spin on leadership and what it is. It's really entrepreneurial leadership, which is a bit different than what I would consider just leadership in general. So one of the one of the major propositions of leadership, and if you think about, we'll go to this slide for a second. If you think about your life and you think about what you do on a regular basis and consider your family life, consider your friend life, consider your academic life, consider your social life, which would be friends. Where in your life have you taken the role of a leader? Or where in your life have you considered stepping up and doing something in a leadership platform? And here are some examples on the board. I, I just would, I would probably argue that every single person in this room in one way or another has taken a leadership role in their family or in their social circle. So some of the examples are led a committee or a task force, served as a captain or co-captain on an athletic team, held an office in a school or college club, organized ongoing home sales activities, worked in multi-level sales, recruited or mentored new members, might be a little much, led a choir or a band. So one of the interesting concepts of leadership, and especially when it comes to entrepreneurial leadership, is that if you're going to lead and if you're going to take some sort of initiative towards designing a future that is better than the present or designing a future that is more optimal than the past, you have to have a vision. And if you think about vision, if you really break it down to what it actually is, you know, when you, when, you, when you think about vision with your eyes, you see something. But what's so wild is that when you see something now in the present, you're seeing what is happening now. And certainly when you think about the past, you're not really seeing the past. You're visualizing the past from your experiences. So not to get too complex, but in order to have a vision, you have to think about what the future is going to look like. And you have to articulate that vision somehow uh, based on a, based on something you see in your mind or in your head. And not a lot of people can do that. Not a lot of people have the skill set or not a lot of people have practiced the ability to envision a desired future state. But as entrepreneurs, we have to do that. We have to realize that we are pressing on towards a future that is better than the past and that is better than our present reality. And it's it's more complex than that because it's almost impossible to really predict the future. It's impossible. But as entrepreneurs and certainly as people that are leaning towards an opportunity, we have to get good at that. So if you think about the process of entrepreneurship up on the board here, the first step, which you all have done, is identifying an opportunity. And what I know it seems repetitive, but when you identify an opportunity as an entrepreneur, it's not a one time thing. You're identifying opportunities consistently throughout the business model. You're looking at an opportunity for a customer segment, then you're looking for an opportunity to partner with a key partner, and then you're looking for an opportunity to possibly be creative with a new revenue driver. There's, um, there is a group of people that go and do leadership workshops, and they go to different uh, large institutions, and they teach people how to lead. And they leave the institution after a couple of days of leadership workshops with uh, leaders who have now been kind of tested on the leadership concepts. But when they leave, they don't have a programming to do any leadership coaching, to go deeper for some of the people that were capable of, of getting some of that programming. So an opportunity for them, if you have your opportunity glasses on, is to create a new revenue driver and to offer one-on-one -on -one leadership coaching. So in addition to the workshop that they just kind of touched on some concepts, they can add a revenue driver entrepreneurially to do some coaching. It's a little bit different of a business model, but it's an opportunity. And some people think, oh, well, we just do workshops. That's not the case. So you're constantly trying to identify new opportunities within your business, within your, your revenue stream and whatnot. So I, I put this process up on the board just so that we can continue talking about it as a class. We're identifying an opportunity. We're developing a business concept through the business model, which is what we're doing now. And then we're going to look for ways that we can gather the resources that we need in order to execute on the business model. And that's, of course, acquiring necessary resources. We're implementing the business model. That's exciting. We're actually registering for the LLC. We're registering for the sole proprietorship. We're not, I mean, we can do that in this class if you want to, but the goal is to think about the end in mind. So if we're going to go about doing this, this is kind of a part of the beginning process as well. What does this business look like when it's fully running, when it's fully implemented, when we're billing customers and when we're collecting cash? And then, of course, we're managing the business through a growth phase or we're managing the business just through our uh, side hustle type of endeavor. And then eventually the business is either going to stop operating or the business is going to sell. 
And I'm sure if I asked you all to raise your hand and say, which would you prefer? Would you prefer the business just to stop? Or would you prefer the business be sold for, you know, 100,000, 200,000 or $100 million? I mean, the goal hopefully is to exit the business with some wealth and certainly to leave a legacy for the future. So I, I want to bring up two examples. And again, it's very, it's, it's, you know me when I teach, I like to engage and I like to see you guys. So it's difficult for me to do this online, but I want, hopefully if you're paying attention, you think about this guy named Walt Disney. And Walt Disney, who I'm sure you all know, was the founder of Disney. And when Walt Disney was going about creating his opportunity, he didn't much care about whether or not he succeeded. And I say that because he was an artist. He was a he was an entrepreneur. He was a creator. And he saw opportunity and in, in a skill, a talent. He was he was creative beyond belief. And when he would go and try to pitch his creativity to other people on a multitude of occasions, he was turned down and he was rejected. But as an opportunist <clears throat> and as a creator, even after going through bankruptcy, Walt Disney continued to press on, he continued to be resilient and he continued to persevere in order to create what we all live in today is the world of Disney and look at what it is today. So being able to recognize opportunity is one thing, but also being able to uh, shift and shape that opportunity over time. I, there's a lady, I don't know her name, but she was she's very wealthy and she sold um, makeup. And it was actually makeup for women who uh, were a little bit, had eczema or difficult skin conditions. And the makeup was, was a bit different. And she was able to um, over and over and over again, get rejected, 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 and continue to persevere, continue to leverage resources. And eventually she opened up a shop. Eventually she got a deal on the TV programming, which was like QVC or something like that. And she got exposed to a huge market and she sold her business for like a billion dollars uh, a couple of years ago to a major, to like Mary Kay. Um, I don't know her name. I wish I could think of it, but this is just another opportunity. She's humble enough to know that her product or her service or the value that she was adding makes a difference. And she pushed on and continued to uh, you really have that vision. I think it goes back to being able to lead with that vision, but also being able to lead, understanding that the opportunity and the vision kind of go together. So what is an opportunity? Opportunity is favorable set of circumstances, creating a need uh, for opening, a need for opening for a new business concept, a situation where something can be improved at a profit, the existence of a pain that can be removed, something is unsatisfactory. So I think, I mean, I, I think I told you my daughter went through uh, chemotherapy treatments. She had acute lymphoblastic leukemia and the doctors and the institutions behind delivering a uh, cancer treatment is huge. And I use that as an embellished example of our ability to get healthcare and the doctor's ability to be entrepreneurial with finding treatment plans for uh, young children who have leukemia. This is a major pain. We cannot have this, this cancer in our system. So to be able to get treatment, uh, removed a significant pain from our lives and certainly uh, saved my daughter's life. So think about things that people are suffering from right now, cancer being one of them, that as your business continues to grow or continues to be expanded, really articulate what that pain is. And I think there's a, a business that has, <clears throat> you're alleviating an information gathering process for new students that are in the United States and aren't quite sure how to navigate some of the different uh, nuances of uh, matriculating into the, the local school system and that your platform is going to alleviate the pain of, of confusion, alleviate the pain of looking for the necessary tools and resources in order to be successful. That's a big deal. But to be able to articulate that vision and to be able to articulate that pain, it takes leadership. It takes tenacity. Tenacity is one of my favorite words. Tenacity really subfactors into two things. Focus, which was my word of the year two years ago. Focus is such a great word. Tenacity is my word of the year this year. Uh, focus and resilience at the same time. So you have to be focused on an outcome and be able to take your resources and really drill home on it. And at the same time, you have to be tenacious or sorry, uh, resilient because something might uh, hamper your focus. It might distract you. But good leaders, good entrepreneurial leaders are tenacious. They're focused and they're resilient. Uh, and then the last thing about opportunities, but you have, <laughs> but, but you can have opportunity without something being wrong. So this is something that we've talked about in the past. It's, 
it's creating a, um, it's educating your consumers about a life that they can have. And you certainly have to be a visionary in order to articulate that. So there's not an existing pain, but there's a way in which you can talk to your customers and say, hey, did you know that you could, you could achieve this, like, you know, car sharing and um, online banking, things like this. I didn't know that I needed to do all my bills online until they made it an option for me. And the banks told me, hey, listen, you can do all this stuff that you used to do in person online. And it's like, hey, that's interesting. Let's do it. Didn't have an existing pain, but they made something that I had to do in my everyday life easier, better, and they educated me on it. So that would be an example of that. <clears throat> so we're talking about leadership. We're talking about entrepreneurship. And we're talking about one of the most important things that entrepreneurs do is they have the, the ability to see opportunities, capitalize on opportunities, and stay tenacious on the opportunities that they see. So you're, what you're doing is you're challenging existing assumptions. You're looking for patterns or trends in markets, demographics, social behaviors, customer buying behavior, or competitive practices. You're monitoring changes in rules, laws, or regulations. So one of the major rules, laws, and regulations that we talked about in the past is the uh, the need for corporations to be emissions-free or for these automobile manufacturers to focus on electric vehicles. So there is a, a slew of infrastructure changes that are going to follow this um, goal of, say, GMC being completely green by the year 20, 2035. And if that's the case, then there's going to have to be charging stations, there's going to have to be um, new batteries, there's going to have to be uh, new ways of selling things through electric vehicle manufacturers. So there's there's entrepreneurial changes and opportunities just based on governmental rules, laws, and regulation. And that's kind of really interesting. I do work with the electric co-op industry. And a lot of times the electric co-op industry tends to have a little bit of a lag when it comes to implementing changes because there's a lot of, um, you know, they're, they're tradesmen, they're tradespeople, and they they tend to like what they do and it's hard to change. So and there's a lot of, it's a the people-focused business too. But the point is the government regulation kind of gets pushed down. And with that, technological changes follow. So that's just another example of uh, regulation leading to entrepreneurial opportunity. And then you can also look for opportunity through conducting your own research. I think it's really interesting just to go online and to look at, if you say you have a business, there's um, a business in the classroom for the volleyball uh, tournament, so the, the volleyball league. And you could actually just look and, and ask around to look for opportunities within the uh, the sports events industry, like things that people are doing now that are quite unique and new and see if you can just uh, not copy them. That's the wrong word, but mirror them. So I'm thinking in my mind right now that if you have a, an event or a league, or let's just say that you have a bunch of teams together in one place and you think, all right, all of these teams, they registered as teams. Great. Is there a way to get these teams not registering as teams, but register as individuals and say like you you have uh, bonus points for certain individuals that are loyalty players or certain individuals that may have stats that are different than other individuals and say your the cost of your registration is less if you have certain number of spikes or certain number of aces or whatever that looks like. So getting creative with the way in which you register people for tournaments is something fun to think about as well. And obviously while they're at the tournaments, you can upsell them things or you can put some gamification into it. Uh, you could uh, set up uh, bios online. You know, there's all sorts of cool stuff that you can do and you can certainly sell them food and energy drinks and and um, smoothies after the tournament. So this is this is a, a, a large breadth of entrepreneurial opportunity within an existing market. So think this way, think entrepreneurial. And of course, you have to lead that vision. You have to constantly articulate that vision. You have to embody that vision as the entrepreneur moving forward. So moving away from opportunity recognition, and this is, um, my video is distracting, okay. If you, if you now are situated in a place where people are bought in, people understand that you have something unique and that you as an entrepreneur are in the process of creating a business and you're now launching and here we go. You have a great business concept. And one of the things that will set you apart as an entrepreneur, uh, either if you're the leader on the team within this class environment or if you're a member of a team within this class environment, is the ability to understand how to influence people. And it's as simple as that. If we know 
how to get people to want what we want. And we understand a little bit about leadership and we understand a little bit about human behavior. It will go a long way to cover up some of the inadequacies we have as entrepreneurs. So we don't know everything. We're not perfect. Our business concept, I mean, we talked about Walt Disney and the, um, the owner of Hershey Chocolate, uh, Monty Hershey, I, think, I forget his name, but he also went bankrupt. And I, this new movie came out with Willy Wonka at a chocolate factory. I haven't seen it yet, but I, I know this story. And the it's it's a powerful movie. If you haven't seen it, I think it's out on uh, video. But you know, this guy he he knew how to influence people, and he knew how to connect with people. And that is a leadership trait. And that is leadership in itself. And if you are an entrepreneur and you discover an opportunity, that's great. You could have the most amazing application in the world. But if you can't sell it, if you can't convince other people with your vision and with your leadership that this is the right way to move, it's not going to work. So that's why leadership is so important. And what is leadership? Leadership is a process in which an individual influences a group of individuals to achieve a common goal. Big deal. Some of you may have experienced this in the subset of your, of your teams already, where you sort of have to you have to figure out the best approach to let your team know that this is the right target market to pursue and it's not that one. But the right thing to do is not to say, hey, you're wrong and I'm right. It's different than that. So some other definitions of leadership is the influential increment over and above mechanical compliance with direction and orders. I don't like that one very much. I love this one. An act that causes others to act or respond in a shared direction. I'm going to say that again. An act that causes others to act or respond in a shared direction. What a powerful concept of, of what leadership and especially entrepreneurial leadership is. There is a um, big event happening in Miami soon that hopefully you all can look into and possibly attend. It's called Emerge. And at Emerge, they have an opportunity. There's also something with Miami Dade College where Blackstone Launchpad will come in and they'll do a series of business pitch competitions. And I, hopefully I can send out some more information uh, after this class or somehow in your emails, you can take your business idea that you have now and why not bring it into a pitch competition where there'll be judges and maybe, you know, 20, 30 people in the room. And I know that sounds intimidating, but go through the process of practicing pitching this idea to other people. And that's leadership. That's creating a vision for them. And that's uh, demonstrating to them that you have something that you want them to act upon. So leadership is needed at all levels in an organization. If you are, say, the leader of your team, it doesn't mean that the other people on your team don't need to lead. They still need to be a part of that process as well. And it's a shared, uh, it's a shared endeavor. Leadership is shared amongst other people. So let me just um, try to elevate this concept of leadership as a merchant. So I think this morning it was Valentina and certainly Anthony uh, that stepped up, whether you thought so or not, but you were the ones to uh, get the laptop connected. You were the ones to put the laptop on uh, the front of the classroom and you helped make this happen. And that wasn't because you were assigned a leadership role. That's because you emerged as a leader. And in entrepreneurship, and especially when we're running a business, you want other people around you to be emergent leaders. So good entrepreneurial leaders create other entrepreneurial leaders. That's a major concept. So emergent leaders are group members who significantly influence other group members, even though they have not been assigned formal authority. One can therefore exert leadership by being an influential coworker. And leadership, just like entrepreneurship, is a process. And the process of leadership really is the process of building a relationship with other people. And building a relationship takes work. It takes time. I don't know about you, but most of the say, intimate relationships that I have in my life, my familial relationships, my relationship with my children, my relationship with my wife, the ones that I really care about, that I want to know more than just the surface level, hey, how you doing? Nice to see you. No, I want to I want to feel like they are seen and truly known and loved for all of their ins and outs and all this kind of stuff. So if you felt that way about your leader, and let's just say that, you know, um, one of your teachers or say one of your, uh, you had a, a summer job and you had a coach or a boss at your summer job and above and beyond them asking you about your work responsibilities or what time you're going to get there tomorrow and how you're going to deliver value to this company that we're working for. They sit down and they ask, how are you doing? And they listen. 
and they they ask you questions about your life and they actually care and they want to see you excel, not just at work, but also in other areas. That's powerful. And the question is, would you want to work for a leader or a boss or an entrepreneur that does that? And I, I the, the opposite spectrum, and maybe you've been around these type of people, they have such blinders on with their entrepreneurial vision or they have such blinders on with seeing the opportunity that they miss they're not paying attention to other things that are happening around them. And those other things that are happening around them are called people and people want attention and the right people on your team are going to want you to pay attention to them. So they're going to want you to build a relationship with them. That's the point. If you're going to be a successful entrepreneur, you need to be able to articulate a vision. You need to be able to stay tenacious towards that vision and you need to learn how to build relationships with people along the way. Major point. That's the point. So leadership is a relationship between a leader and those being led. Theoretical analysis. It's not great to start a bullet point like that, but think about it this way. Explains that leadership is not a trait or behavior of an individual. What does that mean? We talked last time about how entrepreneurs tend to be extroverted. Entrepreneurs tend to be opportunity seeking. Extra entrepreneurs tend to have these certain characteristics, but leadership isn't just trait or behavior. But it's a phenomenon. It's something that uh, that happens without us being able to explain exactly how it happens. That's what a phenomenon is. It's like, why is that happening? You know, think about the the clouds formulating in the sky right now. Think about the the Earth rotating on its axis. Think about the fact that I'm speaking words that you can comprehend. That's pretty wild in itself too. That's a phenomenon. It's generated in the interactions among people acting in a given situation or a given setting. That's a cool way to think about leadership. The given setting refers to the context of the relationship. I'm going to skip through this uh, because I'm not sure if it's needed at this point, but I'm going to just mention that leadership and management sort of go together, but they're different. And because I said I was going to skip over it, I'm going to go ahead and do it. But the the major parallel is leaders are capable of inspiring others towards a vision. That's very important. And they play these roles that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Whereas managers, there's a leading component to management. I'll go back. But the point is managers are more checks and balances. Managers are more entrepreneurial. I'm sorry. Managers are more administrative. And they usually have the um, planning, organizing, a little bit of leading and controlling aspects of the company. So leadership is about vision. Management is about the, the processes and the operations needed to achieve the vision. And I, I use the example of if you're going to, um, if you want to go on, say, a sailboat, and it's a beautiful sailboat, and the, you know, it's just gorgeous. And there's a captain that wants you to come aboard their sailboat. And they're going to take you from Florida up to Boston, Massachusetts in the summertime. And it's going to be a trip of a lifetime. And they're going to have to paint that vision for you. What, what does the boat look like? How long is the trip? What are we going to do? How is this going to work? And then you're going to be bought into that vision. You say, all right, great. I'm in. But if they didn't have a manager, if they didn't have a first mate, that vision is very difficult to make happen. So the manager of the first mate is the one that actually Make sure the boat is available. Make sure there's enough life preservers on the boat. Make sure that the winds are of a certain velocity. And to make sure that we actually get to our destination on time and under budget. <laughs> I know I said I wouldn't talk too much about the leadership and management, but there you go. The, the skill set of being a good communicator is one of the most important skill sets, not just for leadership, but for life. And Maybe you have heard this from other people, but I can't stress it enough that in order to build a relationship, in order to be a good, successful entrepreneur, and in order to achieve some of the goals that you want to achieve in your life, building the skill set of communication is so very important. And you might think, oh, communication is be confident, look somebody in the eye, ask them how they're doing and listen. That is like one thirtieth of what communication is. It's a part of it but it's one thirtieth of it. The ability to communicate is, is done verbally, it's done in writing, it's done visually, and it's also done non-verbally through some of the movements, how I'm dressed right now, how you walk, how you present yourself, the consistency of your uh, cultural conduct, 
All of these things matter and they matter continuously. So communication is very important. Uh, the cause or resolution of all human conflict or achievement. A single business biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. One of the most powerful things you can do if you are articulating a business concept or vision is practice, first of all, and then make sure that after you practice, you get feedback. Do you understand or could you potentially articulate that yourself if I go ahead and explain to you the six sources of power and why they're important? And then I take a pause and we were sitting in class together. I would ask, okay, what do you think? Did you understand that? What was your favorite one of those? How can we expand upon that? A lot of times communication is done through talking or uh, learning is done through talking. So it's it's one thing for me to be sitting here and explaining to you what the six sources of power are, which have to do with leadership. But it's a whole other thing to say, hey, once I go through this six sources of power, I'm going to ask you to come up and explain to me what you just heard. Not only would you listen better, but when you come up and explain it, you're now using different parts of your brain in order to articulate it yourself. And so once you hear it, another uh, phenomenon of how our brain works is you hear it, you retain it. That's fine. If you're listening to YouTube videos and you're just thinking that you're getting, um, you're getting smarter just by listening to it, you are, but if you're listening to it and then you write it down. And then, so in addition to transferring it from your ears, you're now making it uh, visual in your life and your brain is working to write it down and it's processing it. Then you speak it. That's a powerful concept and then take it a step further. Then you can teach it. So you hear it, you write it down, you speak it out loud, and then you can teach it. And then once you have those four realms together, then you really know it. So the reason why I say that, and if you think about uh, influence and you think about communication and you think about leadership and you think about entrepreneurship, and then you think about marketing, you have to constantly be saying, hey, we have this amazing product and it does this, this, and this, and here's how it's gonna impact your life here, here, and here. Do you think that would help you? Yes. Well, tell me why. When would you buy it? Do you think you would buy it now? No. Okay, cool. Then you go back and say, well, how about this, 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 and this? And you're constantly hitting them with communication to get them to process this stuff in a new way. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's like, I get it. So one of the things that happens when I learn, and I'm kind of an, I don't know if I'm normal or not in some sense, my wife thinks I'm crazy, but I, what I really like to do is I like to, um, I like to listen to it and I like to take notes. I take notes, take notes, take notes. And then when the most important thing, when somebody else is teaching me something like physically, I'll sit there and I'll look at them and I'll, I look at them like within disagreement. I'm like, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. And I ask them too many questions and sometimes they get annoyed with their questions. And then all of a sudden they'll say something and I'll say, what was that? You know, that little piece of nugget ties everything else together. And then boom, my entire perspective on the subject matter changes, but that takes intentional communication. All right. The six sources of power. Okay. So power is kind of an interesting word. And sometimes people think that power is really wielded by those that are in a position of power. This is not true. Every single one of you in this class has power. Congratulations. You have the power to influence the people around you. You have power to uh, develop a network of people online, uh, social media influence, and you have the power to communicate to them things that you want to be communicated. So just because you have legitimate power, which is the first one, power from role status within an organization involves formal authority. I'm the boss. I have the manager title. I have the owner title, whatever that looks like. That's legitimate power. And yes, there is an authority that comes along with that power. Yet it is only one of six sources of power. Another one, which is which is one of my favorite, is referent power. It's based on a person's charisma or likability, attracting others' loyalty just by your ability to listen, be kind, have a good value system, and be consistent in who you are and what you bring to the table. People will gravitate towards you. And here's the interesting thing. When somebody in power starts to kind of get out of line, People will actually look to you to help them make decisions. And it's, I, I think the stereotypical way to do it is to say, you know, if you have some tyrant as a boss within your job, but you're a good person, you care about other people and you've made a lot of friends. And at that job, that boss, that entrepreneur has been belittling everyone. Um, they have legitimate power. And at a certain point, you're watching somebody get belittled and you step up and say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to take this anymore. And I don't appreciate you talking to my friend like that. And then 
five or six other people within the organization come behind you and say the same thing. And finally, because you have this reference power, you you have these relationships with people, you're able to suppress or subdue the behaviors of that person in authority because of your ability to build a coalition of people who, who enjoy you, people who respect you. That's referent power. And another funny example is someone said, I'm quit, I quit. Who's coming with me? And then everybody else quits because they all don't want to be there unless you're there. It's kind of a silly example, but you know that's that's a, a form of referent power as well. And I guess one other aspect, if you're a leader and you're an entrepreneur, you have to know who on your team might have that referent power, who on your team is influential amongst the peers, because it's probably a good idea to um, train them as leaders and, and get them to be on your team as well. Because if they're on your team, that means the people that enjoy them and like them and respect them are also on your team. Expert power. So the only reason why I'm here talking to you about this subject today is because well, number one, I really care about it. And number two, I've worked my entire life to build some level of credibility when it comes to entrepreneurship and when it comes to leadership. And I've done it. And I've done it for years. And I've created uh, probably five or six different businesses. I currently own one, I own two. And I've, I've sold businesses. I've built businesses. I've been around this my entire life. And I would assume, and I'm not going to say I'm an expert, but there's a level of influence that I have just simply because of the experience I have. So this is expert power. It stems from a person's skills and knowledge, powerful in areas of expertise. So uh, Vicente has a, a skill of playing volleyball. And he, if I don't know how good of a volleyball player he is, but the reality is he has some level of expert power of understanding the rules, the regulations, the way the game is set up and, and how things go. So if you're going to build a business in that industry, you would look to him and say, hey, what do I do here? How does this work? Do you necessarily need to know all of that information yourself about the sport? No. But if you have somebody on your team who does, they now have a source of power. So this happens all the time, especially in the trade industry. Let's just say that you have a small company and they're acquired by a bigger company. And the reason why they're acquired is because they have a lot of customers. And the reason they have a lot of customers is because there's a few people within that organization and have relationships with those customers. And those relationships are important. And those relationships provide that organization value. And so there's a level of relational expert power there. That's what I'm trying to say. So a um, couple more minutes, I'll fly through these next ones. Uh, reward power is the ability to give rewards or incentives like promotions or pay raises. And um, as a professor, just to use this or the ability to give a certain grade or bonus points, whatever that looks like. If the people who can can give you something, the people who could provide you with a, an explicit motivation, um, a, whatever, a car, a raise, some money, um, whatever that is, recognition, that's reward power. And a lot of you do, whether you know it or not, you have this. And if you have like a little sister, a little brother, and you want them to do your chores, uh, they're not just going to do the chores for you. But if you say, hey, you know, I'll give you my milkshake, they're going to be like, oh, well, you have a milkshake. I want a milkshake, so I'll do it for you. And so you reward them with the milkshake when they do your chore. That's that's a perfect example of they might not respect your legitimate power. They don't care about your reference power. They certainly don't care about your expert power, but you have reward power. So they're like, all right, I'll, I'll do that for you. If you present your business plan competition in front of judges, they have the ability to deem you worthy and say, yes, I agree with you or no, I don't. So there's a level of reward power that they have, like it or not. So to understand that dynamic is important. Um, coercive power. This is power that's used. Uh, it shouldn't be one that we should use first, but it is a power that needs to be wielded at times. It's power through fear, using sanctions or withholding resources. So what I mean by that is at times certain people, you know, if they don't, if they don't do what you ask them to do, they could actually get hurt or they can get in trouble and you, you really want them to. So in order to get them to do what they, they need to do, you coerce them. You basically say, if you don't do this, then I will do that. So that's coercive. It's using power through fear. And let me see if I can think about an example of that. It's, you know, you're working on a team right now and you're, you're do you and somebody else is doing all the work and you've tried to get another teammate to do some of the work and to participate in the conversations, whatever that looks like. And eventually you get to the point where you just, you can't get this person to do any work on the project to help with your team. That's a problem. So you can say, listen, if you don't start working, I'm going to go to the professor and I'm going to explain to the professor that you're not doing anything. So that, and then they're like, oh, okay, well, let me, let me do something. 
That's a form of coercive power. Informational power, access to valuable knowledge, useful for persuasion and influence. So if you came to your meeting today and you pulled, say, an industry report on the industry in which your business is operating, you now have informational power amongst your team. They want to know what you know. And now in this day and age with the internet and with social media and all of these accesses to tools, informational power is is really important, you know, to, to have this information, it could help us make decisions, it could help us uh, influence others, and it's a form of power. So lastly, and just to summarize the class and to say thank you and to tell you what sections of the business model that we're going to be working on next in assignment two, um, summarize power, combining these power sources can enhance an individual's overall power and effectiveness in achieving goals. That's the point, that's the, uh, the deal, and that's my little lecture for today. So hopefully you guys can see that opportunity along with entrepreneurial leadership and along with understanding how to build relationships and understanding a vision is important for you to be successful as entrepreneurs.